Presenting the world's greatest mysteries. And now, your host. This is Basil Rathbone. Everybody loves a mystery, and I'm no exception. And that's why it gives me so much pleasure to act as your guide on this series. You see, we've gathered together some of the finest mystery stories in the world. Stories from many places and from many times. Some of them are up to date, well, as up to date as today's newspaper. And others are classic stories of the past. But today's mystery, for instance, it takes place in Europe, the Europe of modern times, a world of intrigue and suspense where a man's life can count for very little when a country's future is at stake. Mike, our storyteller, works in the Paris office of a famous American newspaper. His job is to look for the stories that make the news, and he finds them in the places where the news is made. In a moment, our play begins. Presenting Europe Confidential. It creates a heavy pull. Don't complain of their weight, old chum. Remember, the heavier they are, the richer we'll be. In a moment, we'll bring you Lionel Merton as Mike Canoy, the Paris correspondent of a famous American newspaper, in another exciting story in our series, Europe Confidential. This is Mike Canoy. It's my job on this newsbeat of mine to meet all shades of characters. The honest, the not so honest, and the rogues, pure and simply. I guess there wouldn't be any hesitation about it. Paul Garfield would go into that last category. For Paul Garfield made his living by his wits. And I knew that day in Beirut that he wasn't hanging around the waterfront just to catch the sea breeze. Beirut was way off Garfield's regular beat. Quite a distance off mine, too. My presence there, I could explain. The explosive Middle East situation. But his explanation was much more original. Wondering why I'm here, are you, Conway? Well, not a word to the police, old chum, but I'm about to uphold law and order. <laughs> yeah, that'll be the day. Believe me, I have the backing of at least three governments behind me. You know, I'd just love to know which three. I'll confide in you, Conway, though it's against my better judgment. You may know, gold in the Orient fetches higher prices than in Europe. A shocking thing, Conway. A great deal of gold is being smuggled east through Beirut and the Persian Gulf. Yeah. Doesn't sound honest. A distressing practice. I was approached on a high level and told that certain European governments would look very kindly on any efforts to halt the smuggling. For mm -hmm. instance, if the smugglers were made to realize their shipments do not occasionally get through as planned, for one who could make them realize this, the proceeds of such gold would be given to the man who makes the arrangements, if you follow me, Conroy. Yeah, well, I'm trying to. You've been told to hijack some smuggled gold shipments, and if you do, the gold's yours. Hijack? Well, hardly. This is an honest venture. Well, how can it be done? Simple. You see, the usual route for the smugglers is from Beirut by charter plane to a small shakedom on the Persian Gulf called Kuwait. Mm -hmm. Here, the gold's dumped out on the sand. No armed guards, no security, no precautions. The sheikhs in Kuwait presently have it carried a small craft, dows, in the harbor. Aboard these dolls, the gold is hidden under legal cargoes of dates or pigs. 
A men to sell these to Karachi or Gore or Macau or... No armed guards? <laughs> Ridiculous, isn't it? The sheiks are persuaded that their local punishment for thievery is enough of a deterrent. Oh, and the local punishment is, uh... Well, my principles don't go into details on that. More important matters to discuss, you know. Well, uh, maybe I can give you the hello down here. Uh, I've heard something about this local uh, shake treatment. They believe in public flogging, notching of the nose, clipping off ears. Uh, nothing really serious, of course, but... Flogging and nose... Years. Uh, it's an old Mid-Eastern custom. Don't get caught, will you, Paul? You know, I don't think you'd like it a bit. Away he went. And I'd have given plenty to go along, but he wasn't trusting any newspaper man that far. It's all the rest of the story I had to reconstruct from what I found out later. And this is just the way it happened. It seems that after he left me, Paul Garfield met up with a couple of his chosen chums, Clancy, an Irish pilot, and Singh, a Lascar sailor, both of them very eager to earn a fast buck and not too choosy about how they went about it. Kuwait? Sure. I've been there a dozen times. Charter flights to the airfield there. And you, Singh, you know the wharves at Kuwait? Know where you can lay your hands on a good seaworthy dow there? Easy. Clancy, I understand there are certain scoundrels who smuggle gold through Kuwait. Sure. Flight from here in Beirut, dump it on the sands, some natives come along after a while and cart it down to the docks. And that's just what we'll do. Now remember, both of you, from now on, I am Dr. Paul Garfield, FRCS, well-known archaeologist, right? Whatever you say, Paul. Singh, you leave at once for Kuwait and hire a doll. Clancy here and I will give you a head start. Hey, then we'll fly to the airport, but we'll have to land because of engine trouble. I am an archaeologist looking for likely ruins to dig up. Clancy, yeah. you will not be able to fix our engine until the moment when there is a big shipment of gold lying on the sand by the airport. This begins to sound promising. At that point, you tell me the engine is all right again. I arrive, change inside the plane to the clothes of a native. Singh drives a cart up. He and I load the gold shipment into the cart, drive it down to the docks, dump it into the dow, and sail a hundred miles down the gulf. Where I meet you with a plane. Right. And we fly on to Karachi and sell it. Why not? Nobody stops us. So long as everything works just as the chicks always do it. Simple and sweet. He's worth a fortune. And a quarter share for each of you when it's sold in Karachi. Done? Done. <laughs> Grapevine had news of a rich, fat shipment of gold due into Beirut in a couple of days. They gave Singh a head start, then Garfield and Clancy took off for Kuwait. Five and a half hours across the deserts and mountains of the Middle East, and their plane was circling above an airfield. There it is. Can you make the motor miss to make a landing look good and necessary? Right. Heat reached up and met them, swallowed them. It was infernally hot, a moist, humid heat. Clancy went away to report his engine trouble and asked for parking space, but he was back in a few minutes. Hey, Paul! Paul! What's the matter? They didn't swallow your story about the plane? Oh, sure, sure, that's okay. But I was in the dispatcher's office. I saw a letter on his desk. Yeah? Plane due in tomorrow with a consignment for the Sheikh Sir Suleiman El Hamad bin Tamur. So what? I know him, that's what. He's the biggest man in the gold business here in Kuwait. It must be the shipment we heard about back in Beirut, don't you see? In tomorrow, huh? I'll have to work fast and in this heat, too. You stay here and fuss with the plane. I'll get into town, buy some native clothes, and contact Singh. <laughs> Ah, there she is. Tied up at the end of the wharf. See? Well, they all look alike, these dogs. Ah, that's good. Harder to catch us. Crew? Good way. Cargo of dates to hide our crates under? Already up what? You hide a cart. We'll need it tomorrow morning. I'll be there. You just say when? One o'clock. One? In the afternoon. But the heat, 130 degrees at least. Exactly, old chum. As people around to watch us, the better. <laughs> Garfield left the waterfront, went back to the town's best hotel, carrying his package of clothes. The town's best was a glum hostelry with a villainous-looking clerk. 
Paul put over his archaeology story and handed the clerk a card printed for the occasion. Yes, sir, Dr. Garfield. You want rooms, fine suite, running water, hot and cold, a cross ventilating, very fine suite. Sign here, please. He leaned down, signed his name, and then straightened again, glancing over his shoulder. That was when he saw her. Luggages, sir. You have luggages, no doubt, less. Dr. Garfield, where are your luggages, sir? Just only this bundle. That woman. Who is she, man? Across the way. That is Falura. She is a dancer. Dr. Garfield, your luggage. Never mind my luggage, a minute. Hello. You asked my name, Dr. Garfield. I see your lips move. How do you know me? Everyone hears of the plane that is forced to land of the famous archaeologist. What's a girl like you doing here in a place like this, huh? I have been waiting, perhaps, for you to come and take me away with you. No? All that was in your look a few moments ago. You're staying here at this hotel? I'll call for you this evening. Not this evening. This evening I am engaged, but you shall see me tomorrow. Too late. I'll be gone. So? Or will you wait to stay over tomorrow after all? I think you will wait for me. She turned and walked away, and she didn't look back. He watched while she went out and down the steps and into the limousine that was waiting at the door. Oh, it was too bad. If it hadn't been for the gold that would lie waiting on the airfield beside the strip tomorrow morning. Oh, too bad. Come in. Dr. Garfield, sir. Oh, it's you. What do you want? An invitation has come for you, sir. The Sheik throws a big party tonight. He has heard that you, a famous archaeologist in town, visiting. He has sent you an invitation for his big brawl. Very lucky for you, Dr. Garfield. Social event of the whole season in Kuwait. Sheik? What Sheik? Sheik Sir Suleiman El Hamad bin Tamur. Sheik Sir Suleiman. He's greatly anxious to meet you, doctor. Talk of scientific matter. Scientific matters? Chic famous amateur archaeologist. Writes many books. Glad to talk with you, Dr. Gatti. Dr. Paul Garfield had to send his regrets. He would like to attend the Sheikh's party, but he had a splitting headache, the sun and the heat. You know, it, it was too bad. Next morning, he was on his way out of the hotel. Zero hour was coming up, and so was a lithe and lovely girl on the stairs. Where do you go so early, handsome one? Laura, I'm leaving. Leaving Kuwait. It is not possible. I try to tell you. Have to leave today by plane for India. Then I go with you. No, I'm afraid not. You shall take me. Falura, my lovely Arabian moonflower, listen to Oh, me. the first pretty thing you have said to me. I shall treasure Goodbye, it. Falura. You are not coming with me. I'm going alone. Goodbye. No, no, wait. You mean this? Certainly I do. I'm late now. Goodbye. Oh, but wait. I'm... You have toyed with Falura. This is rash. Goodbye. Say au revoir. Goodbye. <laughs> Delora may have been beautiful, but she was beginning to get in Garfield's hair. A half hour later, he was in his native clothes, working with Singh, loading a batch of crates that had been landed by plane and which lay unguarded, defenseless, and ripe for the plucking. They loaded them into the cart that Singh had brought with him, under the broiling sun, while no one stirred in the midday heat. Oh, they're heavy, Paul. Don't complain of their weight, old chum. Remember... The heavier they are, the richer we shall be. Uh, Anyone around? No one. In this heat, not even a mad dog, my friend. There's certainly no English one. Then into the cart with these crates. The gods were with them. Why should anyone stop two Arabs from loading crates into a native cart? What could be more brazen and therefore seem more innocent? Go on, you lazy devil. Off to the airfield with Singh laying his whip across the backs of the two plodding, sweating beasts. Into the town and down toward the docks, past the hotel. 
if you'd like, Paul, take a glance over at the hotel veranda. Oh, boy. Something I'd almost give my share of this gold for. And it was Falora, of course. Garfield glanced quickly out of the corner of his eye and just as quickly glanced away again. She was standing staring at them, and for a moment it seemed as if her hand was going up in an, well, an involuntary gesture of recognition. Ah, what's the matter? That girl, back in the veranda. Take a look. She's still staring at us. Now, you crazy. Why should she? No, of course not. She's gone back into the hotel. Your nerves are jumping. <laughs> By mid-afternoon, they were out in the Persian Gulf, out and away and cool and utterly unsuspected. For the airport officials knew that Dr. Paul Garfield had flown off at one o'clock bound for India and would never guess that his plane, only 200 miles out of Kuwait, would put down, refuel, and be loaded with a heavy and priceless cargo before heading in earnest for India. Ah, I feel better now. Almost weren't airborne back there. That's too heavy a load for safe flying, Paul. <laughs> you too, Clancy. You too. Me too what? Like citizens sing back there, you complain of the weight of our payload. A hundred thousand dollars worth. That's what we'll charge for this cargo in Karachi. Uh, why not put down at Goa? I heard of a Portuguese there named Peranda who buys cargo. Karachi, I said, Clancy. Karachi is the place to get the best price. <laughs> Six hours later, they landed at Karachi Airport. Everything was in order, but speed was of the essence now. Okay, Clancy, everything clear? Sure, Paul. I just want to visit this dealer first to make sure he's the man for us. I should be back inside an hour. Don't let anyone near the plane. Trust me, Paul. I will. He did, and that's where he made his big mistake. It took Garfield an hour to find his merchant in the city. Ten minutes to learn that he had a man who'd make a quick and profitable deal. Half an hour to get back to the airport. Are you Dr. Paul Garfield? That's right. Uh, this note is for you. No, not from whom? Uh, from a pilot named Clancy. He left it just before he took off. Took off? The note made it quite clear. Clancy and Singh had decided 100% was better than 50 Paul stood there staring at the note, remembering that Clancy had wanted to fly to Goa, had mentioned the name of a dealer there. He tried to recollect the name and hardly even noticed the large passenger plane landing, the people disembarking, until a voice cut through his desperately urgent thoughts. Dr. Garfield, Paul, my handsome one. Hello. I took a chance. I thought it would be Karachi where I would find you. A passenger plane was leaving soon after you, and here I am. You're crazy. Oh, after you had left me, I thought, and I thought, handsome one, when you said goodbye, when you refused even to say au revoir, I realized, handsome one, that this was the shy, unworldly professor, embarrassed because of his poverty. So I swallowed my pride and came looking for you. And I have found you again, handsome one. Paranda. That's it. That's the name. What? Whose name? Where are you going, Paul? Wait! Wait! Maybe I can use you. Alora? Uh, yes? I've got a charter of plane to go. It's a business matter of great urgency. A fast plane. I need the fastest. Can you help me with the language? And I will come with you. Oh. All right. If you insist, I guess... Come. We will charter the fastest plane in all Karachi. And Kamadeva shall be our pilot. Kamadeva? In this land, Kamadeva is the god of love. More than 800 miles down the west coast of India lies Goa, capital of Portuguese India. Garfield reckoned that Clancy and Singh had an hour's head start. They couldn't take less than five hours, and the plane he'd chartered was guaranteed to get there in four. He just had a chance. All he had to do would be to get rid of Falura, pay off the pilot, and find Paranda's offices. And just four hours later, he was circling above the ancient city of Goa. They landed. He raced from the landing strip to the administration building. He wanted a taxi. That was his first move, to brush Falura off and go in search of Paranda. Taxi! Taxi! I beg your pardon, but... 
Aren't you Dr. Paul Garfield? Why, yes, I... Paul, where are you going? Uh, Professor Garfield, is it not the well-known archaeologist? Yes, but I really must apologize. I... Taxi! I'm in a terrible hurry right now. Taxi! I can't tell you how I've longed to meet you, Professor. You see, I dabble a bit in archaeology myself. Nothing up to your work, I must say. Your treatise on the diggings at El Amarna. A revelation, my dear sir. I am proud to meet you. Taxi! Perhaps you would be good enough to permit me to accompany you, Professor. Taxi's up. Thank you. Sorry, old chum. We'll talk about the digging some other time. Get going, quick. Oh, don't leave me. Professor, wait. Did you hear me? Get going. Yes, sir. Oh, oh. <laughs> Gently, boys, gently. Yeah, gently, boys, gently. Paul! Give it. You boys are rather inconvenience. Me, please, Clancy, don't reach for your pocket. As you may notice, my hand is already in my pocket, and it isn't my pipe stem that's pointing at you, I can assure you. What, what are you talking about, Paul? That little joke we had on you back at Karachi. Why, we were just... Yes, yeah, a joke, Paul, a joke. When both of you boys are extremely cooperative, I still may let you have 10% of the proceeds to divide between you, minus my expenses in chartering a plane to catch up with you. Does that seem satisfactory, Clancy? And now, don't make me waggle this cumbersome pistol too long. Paul, listen... I know, we were just joking. Nevertheless, the penalty for practical jokes is severe when my profits are involved. Oh, oh my God! You see, he's stopping them. Yes, I think you're right, my dear. I think he is a fellow archaeologist after all. What? Certainly he is, Sir Suleiman. What's this, Sir Suleiman? I thought you knew him, handsome one. This is the Sheikh Sir Suleiman and Hamad bin Taimur. Delighted, Professor. I had been looking forward to a chat the other evening, except that you were suddenly taken ill, I understand. Oh, yes, I... <laughs> and and a... I must say, I'm most grateful for all your efforts at halting these brigands. <laughs> You'll forgive me for a time. I actually thought you were part of the plot to hijack my gold. As soon as you told Falora back in Karachi that the name was Piranda, he found the opportunity to ask Karachi radio operator to send me the information. I was, at the time, flying from Kuwait, and naturally I radioed ahead to my good friend Piranda. We've often done business together in the past. And he arranged to have some Goa police inside his place of business here. Police? Yes, they're ready to take these two thieves in charge right now, I believe. Now, look here, Paul. And a very good thing, too. Oh, Paul, that did not turn out well. You're not getting away with this, Garfield. All right now, my men, just move along inside the shop, please. Be good enough to respect this obviously emotional moment. These two wish to be alone. Yes, and someone... Soon we will be alone. Believe me, for uh, I cannot wait for that moment. Oh, uh, Professor, uh, just before I go, is it possible I have confused your work in the field with that of Sir Paul Hartsfield? Your names are so familiar. Was it his treatise on the dig at El Amana? Well, that's very possible. <laughs> oh, how very embarrassing. Oh, please, it's really of no importance. Suppose you just take care of those two scoundrels, and then maybe we can... Have a real chat about archaeological matters. Fine, fine. Oh, by the way... Yeah? Please accept this uh, a small reward for your friendly intervention. Oh, really? It was... A... No, 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 I insist. Here, Falora, you make him take it. Professor, you perhaps don't realize how valuable a shipment this was that you saved. I'll see you in a few moments. We will wait, Sir Suleiman. Oh, all right. Yes, handsome one. You would prefer not to wait? To be alone with you. I understand. Come, we will see if there's a bank open. It will cash the sheikh's check. You see, the reward is for honesty, handsome one. Yes. Slender return on investment. Come, my moonflower. This reward for honesty can be best celebrated without the presence of the sheikh. Listening to Lionel Merton as Mike Canoy in another exciting episode in the series Europe Confidential.
This is Basil Rathbone again. We've reached the end of today's story, but I'll be back to introduce to you another unusual tale. Remember, for this series, we've searched the whole world to bring you stories of every kind. Tales of espionage, suspense, crime, and intrigue. By famous writers from every part of the globe. In fact, a selection of the finest stories that have ever been assembled in one series. Well, goodbye now till we meet again to listen to another of the world's greatest mysteries.